Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter number 24. Matthew chapter number 24. I want to read through these verses that we've looked at already, beginning in verse number 1 of Matthew chapter number 24. It says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came on him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Verse 21 tells us, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened. Verse 29 reads, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love that stooped to save a sinful soul like mine. And Lord, we continue to pray for those that may be among us, maybe watching online that do not know the Lord Jesus Christ is their Savior. God, may today be the day where your Spirit calls them to Christ. May they understand their sin and the penalty and the judgment that it brings. May they understand that payment has already been made in the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on Calvary. May they be saved today. And Lord, for Christians, some have wandered away. They have chosen to go their own way, do their own thing, live their own life how they see fit. God, I pray that your spirit and your word would call them back home. May they return to a loving relationship with their Heavenly Father. And Lord, I pray for Christians who are struggling, who are hurting. God, uplift them, encourage them. Speak to each and every one of us, no matter where we are, no matter what we're going through. Use your word in our hearts like that sword that pierces. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I have had the privilege to go through and also witness some great disasters in our world. Uh, I remember when my wife and I first moved to Foley, Alabama, we bought a house sometime in the spring, I think sometime around May or so, and uh, a few months later, Hurricane Ivan came in, came in directly due south of Foley, Alabama, about 10 miles south, and uh, came right up and... Uh, you know, being from Iowa, I, I didn't know a whole lot about hurricanes. I had really had no clue what was going on and what I was supposed to do and this and that. I don't know anything about getting my house ready. I didn't board up any windows. I did not do anything that you're supposed to do to get ready and be prepared for a hurricane. And uh, so, I, you know, you begin to learn some things very quickly. Now, in that circumstance, God was very gracious to me in my ignorance. I think at that hurricane, there were houses destroyed, all kinds of damage all over the place. Trees were down, and uh, I think I lost one shingle off of my house, and that was about it. Um, our, our trampoline was another story. Now, I recently got another trampoline. I was a little leery about it because in the hurricane, I, I didn't think to turn, flip it upside down. 
and, or to weigh it down or anchor it down. And we came back and pull up to the house because we traveled. We came all the way back home. I was like, I'm getting out of here. We came all the way back to Iowa for a couple of days until it was clear for us to go back. Get up and drive up our driveway, and there's no trampoline. Uh, where to go? And not long after that, my neighbor, next door neighbor, comes over and says, I, I found your trampoline if you're looking for it. I said, you did? Where is it? He said, it's in my living room. <laughs> the hurricane had picked it up over his house and slammed it through his big bay window and said, I found your trampoline. So you began to learn some things. I, we were not prepared at all. We did not have water ready. We did not really have food or a way to cook it that was ready. We didn't have lights or anything else that was ready. Um, they had uh, the city and state officials that came in. They had the National Guard and everybody that comes in. And they had certain places that you could go and pick up cases of water. And you could pick up cases of MREs. So we had water to drink. We had uh, food to eat, if you want to call it that. God be with our military men who have to eat that stuff all the time. But, uh, you know, we, did, we, we had we found some matches somewhere. I'm not even sure where they came from. Uh, we found some matches somewhere and we were able to light candles that were used in our wedding. And so we were able to have some light. But we were, just, we were not the least bit prepared. Now, there are some people who are really prepared. They are prepared for absolutely anything that could happen. And maybe you've watched the program on television, Doomsday Preppers, or you've seen other shows about that. And really, there's three kinds of Doomsday Preppers. There are those that are prepared just enough. They're planning for the power to go out for a few hours or maybe a day. And uh, they believe that major disasters don't happen. And even if they do, the government will come and rescue them very soon. And so they might have... Uh, you know, a few things ready, but not really a whole lot. Then there's those that are ready for almost anything. Uh, they con they've convinced themselves that they need to have a plan for survival no matter what happens, and uh, they stockpile food and water and other things. And then we have the third group, and this is the group everybody likes to watch and everybody likes to, to talk about. These are the people that say, see you when the dust settles. That no matter what happens, atomic bomb goes off. I've got my bomb shelter. I remember watching uh, one episode where this guy dug underneath his garage. He kept his garage door closed, did not open it at all. He didn't want anybody to know we had this bunker in there, and so he decided to go on TV and tell everybody. Kept his garage door closed and dug this concrete bunker underneath his garage so that if something happened, he could go down in that bunker and he had food and water and all these different things that are stockpiled down there so that he could live for years at a time. And literally when the dust settles, he can come up and figure out and see and find whoever's left. And, uh, but there's different levels of preparedness. One of the things we look at here in Matthew chapter number 24, Jesus having this discussion with his disciples. They had showed him the, the buildings of the temple, a little ways outside the city, and uh, were able to see all of old Jerusalem, all the buildings that were there. And that's when Jesus tells them in verse number 2, that there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. It's going to be destroyed, be wiped out. And we know that happened in A.D. 70, that all those things were torn down. And so as his disciples are stopping to contemplate that for a moment, they ask him a question that probably most of us would ask. They come unto him and say, Tell us, verse 3, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? You know, tell us, when is this going to happen? How are we going to be able to know that the end of the world is coming? I mean, that's what everybody wants to have, that timeline. It's nice to have information so that you can be prepared ahead of time. 
And so he begins to describe and give them. Now, the Bible tells us that no man knows the day or the hour. So first of all, as we talk about being prepared for doomsday, if somebody tells you this is the date, it's going to happen, don't listen to them. Because no man knows. But he says you should be able to look and kind of see the signs that some of these things are beginning. And one of the things that I want to point out to you, he says in verse number 4, as Jesus is talking and answering the question, he begins by saying this, Take heed that no man deceive you. And we find this idea constant throughout the scripture when dealing with prophecy. He says, don't let anybody deceive you. Do not be fooled. He says, I would not have you to be ignorant, my brethren. I want you to know. I think of the prophecy in Daniel chapter number 9 that uh, the angel was told to go and to give to Daniel over and over again. He says, you are to understand. You are to know. I I'm reminded of one well-known pastor of a very large church who I was listening to him speak one time, and he said that he doesn't know or understand the book of Revelation. I think how sad that is. Because the scripture says over and over, you are to know. In fact, about the book of Revelation, it's the only book of the Bible that says, read me, I'm special. That if you will read me and do what's written therein, then you will be blessed. We are to know. We are to be prepared. And so as Jesus is talking to his disciples, he begins right away by giving them the importance of not being deceived. Because as we take some time to read through Matthew chapter number 24, he warns us that there are going to be those that want to deceive you. Look at verse number 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And so he says, I want to warn you. You are to be on guard because many people are going to come and they're going to say all these different things. And even in our lifetime, we have watched as people have made all these different claims and made all these different predictions. Not long ago, we think of this man out in California who has now gone home to be with the Lord, who made these certain predictions. And people were selling off their homes and all their property, cashing in all their retirement so they could buy billboards and all these other things because the end of the world was coming. I remember the, the exact date and time that he said. They showed this elderly man standing in New York Times Square holding up signs. Struck, the clock struck 6 o'clock when things were supposed to happen. Nothing happened. He's kind of watched as that sign that is held up so high, doing what someone told him to do, had cashed in everything, and now he had not one cent to his name, standing there as the crowds are mocking and berating him because nothing is happening. Be not deceived, the scripture tells us. We are to know the truth. We are to know. There will be those that will try to deceive us. And so he relates to us the importance of being prepared for the end of the world. Not just being prepared for a hurricane or a flood or an earthquake or this or that, but the end time events. As they begin to unfold, the question that each of us ought to answer is, are we prepared? If the end time events begun to unfold this morning, could you say, I am absolutely prepared? If we know Christ is our Savior, we have nothing to fear. We don't need to fret. We don't need to be afraid. We don't need to worry about what is going to happen because we're prepared. But there may be some here this morning that if these things begin to unfold, you say, you know what, I'm not ready. I'm afraid. That's what these next few weeks are all about. So we talk about doomsday preppers. I want each and every one of you to know and to understand and be prepared for these things that Jesus is speaking about here in Matthew chapter number 24. He says, don't be deceived. Don't allow someone to trick or to fool you. And constantly around here, one of the things that I encourage people to do is to know and to study the scripture for themselves. 
If some person stands up and says, you don't need to read the Bible, I'll just tell you what it says, you just take my word for it, that's not somebody you want to follow. You ought to be in a place where the word of God is open and, hey, we're going to look and see what God has to say, not necessarily what some man has to say. One of my favorite quotes around here is, if you just blindly follow me and listen to what I have to say, you're an idiot. You are. If you blindly follow any man, any woman, you've got some serious issues. You are prone to being deceived. You are to study it for yourself. I am to study it for myself. Jesus wants us to know the signs of the times. And so he goes on, as we read here, and kind of explains some of those things. He says this, verse number 6, Ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And there are those that they like to work people up into a frenzy. They like to get people scared and afraid because when people are afraid, you can control them. When people are afraid, they will give up liberties for safety. We have watched our nation do that over throughout time. He says, you're going to hear about these wars and rumors of wars. You don't have to be troubled. You don't have to be all stirred up. That word trouble, as we talked about out of John chapter number 14, is the idea of this great storm that comes up. It's an emotional turmoil and stirring up in your heart. Like a hurricane that's coming through. He says, when you hear about these things, these wars and rumors of wars, you don't have to be troubled. He says, for all these things must come to pass, but notice this, but the end is not yet. He says, all these things have to happen, but you don't need to be troubled because this is not the end yet. He says, verse number 8, all these are the beginning of sorrows. And there is a constant illustration that is given about the end time events, and that is of a mother who is about to give birth to a child. There are certain things that kind of trigger off, and a woman's body begins to tell her, it's about time to deliver this baby. There are certain signs. You're not going to know exactly when. Now, they'll give you some sort of calendar and try to figure out this is your due date, but it's a very rare thing when it happens exactly on that date. But her body begins to tell her and prepare her for that moment. There are Braxton Hicks contractions that begin to work and kind of let her know that Things are progressing along. You're not having the baby yet, but we're getting everything lined up and ready to go. That's kind of what he's describing here, that when you hear about these nations that are rising against other nations, these wars that are going on, that the end is not yet. These are just kind of the beginning little contractions that are going to happen. Now, eventually things are going to progress along, just as they do in childbirth. In childbirth, those contractions get stronger. They get more painful, and they begin to get closer together until right when they're right on top of one on top of the other, and then finally that baby is going to break forth. He says that's the way things are going to unfold in the end times. We're going to begin to be able to see some of these beginning contractions, and then things are going to begin at a certain point to progress along. Until you have judgment after judgment after judgment. You can read about those in the book of Revelation and throughout the Old Testament. These judgments that God is going to pour out. And they're going to begin few and far between. And then there at the end, they're going to be one upon the other, upon the other, upon the other. To the point, it's going to be so terrible. He says in verse number 21, or 22, excuse me, that except those days should be shortened. There should be no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And he begins to describe some of the things that are going to happen so that we can see and know that it's getting very close. And we begin to look around our world today and we can begin to see that the time must be drawing very close. The way things are lining up, 
Are we there yet? No, we're not. But they're getting close. And he tells us, verse number 20, 29, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. But you notice these different things that are going to precede that moment. Now the Apostle Paul is going to deal with the Thessalonian believers on this certain issue because there were those that were teaching and preaching that it's already happened. It's already happened. And Paul said, now wait a second. Some things have to progress first. But we ought to be prepared. He challenges each one of us. And Jesus, in Matthew chapter number 25, is going to relate to us the importance of being prepared for when that day comes. And we're going to begin this morning looking at the importance of those preparations. Now, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at some of those things that we need to be prepared. Just as those who are prepping for disasters and other things, these doomsday preppers, they'll store up water. They'll store up food. They'll store up uh, you know, weapons and tools that they can use to take care of themselves. We'll look at some of those things in the coming weeks, but we'll begin where a lot of preppers begin by understanding the importance of being prepared. In Matthew chapter number 25... Verse number 1 says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him and to the marriage. And the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Notice what Jesus says. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. And so he gives us this illustration about this wedding that's going to take place. And the Jewish wedding during this time period was a quite remarkable thing. And uh, we see a lot about it throughout Scripture. And uh, they would kind of be betrothed to one another. And what he would do is he would go and leave his bride. He'd go back to his father's house and he'd build an addition off of his father's house and prepare and get all things ready. And when he had finished preparing this apartment for them to live in, he would go back at a time that was unannounced, and get his bride. He'd be gone for however long it took. And he didn't explain to her that this is when. She just had to be ready. She had to have all the stuff ready to go because when the bridegroom came back, it's time to get married whether you're ready or not. Here I come, as we like to say when we're playing hide and seek. And so here he says... The kingdom of heaven is like these ten virgins. They take their lamps and they go forth. They're getting ready to meet the bridegroom. There were five that were prepared. They had their lamps ready. They were filled with oil. They're all ready to go. Five of them were not prepared. They had their lamps, but there was no oil in it. And so the bridegroom comes. And there's five who are left out in the dark. They're not prepared. They're not ready. And so they are shut out. 
And they're not allowed to go in. He says that's what it's like. He says because of that, you need to watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Just as that bride had no idea when her bridegroom was coming. Her and the bridal party had to watch and be ready and waiting to go. Lord Jesus Christ likens his relationship with the church as a bride and a bridegroom. He is the bridegroom. And we look in John chapter number 14, and we see that Jesus is telling his disciples, I'm getting ready to leave you. He says in verse number 1 of John chapter number 14, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. He says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Just as that bridegroom would go and prepare a place for his bride, Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. Now, most likely, it's not some huge mansion that we often hear about because of the picture that he gives. But he's preparing a place for each of us. Not our own separate place. We're going to go to be with him. It's not I have my own mansion and you got your own mansion and everybody's got their own little thing. No, we're going to be with him. He's going to prepare a place for you, just as this bridegroom is preparing a place for his bride. And notice what he says in verse number 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And so he lets them know that, yes, I am going away. But it's a good thing. I'm going to prepare a place that's just for you. I'm going to make a spot so that you can come and be with me. He says, and if I'm going to prepare that place, you better know and understand, I'm coming again one day to receive you to myself. Just as that bridegroom would go and prepare and get everything all ready to go, then the day would come where it was finished. And he would make that wonderful trip back to get his bride. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming one day to get his bride. The bridegroom doesn't come for everybody. He comes for his bride. He comes for that one that he has a relationship with. And when the Lord Jesus comes, not physically to this earth, we'll talk about that in the coming weeks, Before he comes physically to this earth, he is coming in the clouds, 1 Thessalonians tells us, for the ones that he has a relationship with. If you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, when he comes in the cloud for his bride, he's not coming for you. You are one of the ones that have your lamp, but there's no oil in it. The Spirit of God does not reside in you because you do not have a relationship with Him. And when that happens, you're caught out in the cold. And you will face doomsday. You will face the time where God pours out His wrath on all of mankind. And just as Matthew 24 tells us out of Jesus' own word, there's never been any time of judgment like it and there never will be again. Are you prepared? Are you ready? He says that if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? He says, all right, how can we know? Tell us where you're going and tell us how we can get there. Jesus saith unto him in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, Jesus says. He says, I'm the only way. He said, I'm not coming for everybody. 
I'm coming for those that have a relationship with me. And the only way that we can have a relationship with him is through the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done. We do not earn salvation by being a good person, by doing good works. This past Friday, we went and fed about 180 uh, people who are down on their luck. Whether through choices they made, whether an accident, we got some people that are struggling with addiction, some that are coming out of prison. We spent some time doing that, fed about 180. That doesn't make us good people. We're not going to earn God's favor by feeding the homeless. We're not going to earn God's favor in a way of salvation and a relationship with Him by being a member of a church, whether it's this one or any other church in the world. You can go to church at Vatican City. That is not going to earn you favor with God. It's not about being baptized. It's not about earning money. Jesus said there is one way to have a relationship with me and one way only. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He said, that is the only way. He said, anybody else that tries to come in, you come in any other door but by me. He says, You're a, they're a thief and a robber. They don't have that relationship. And the question I present to you this morning is, are you prepared? When that hurricane hit, I was not prepared. I had no idea. Could I have been prepared? Yes. Could I have asked people who live there, what do I need to do to get ready for a hurricane? They would have told me. You got to board up your windows. You got to turn your trampoline upside down and weigh it down, maybe. Get food together. Get some water together. Be prepared. Have some batteries and all these other things that you need. I could have got the information. I could not blame and point the finger at someone else because I was ignorant of what to do during a hurricane to be ready. The same is true right here. We're not going to be able to point the finger and say, you know what, my pastor didn't tell me. We're not going to be able to point the finger and say, my family member did not tell me. That church did not tell me. It's right here in his word. He says, I want you not to be deceived. Do not be ignorant. He says, understand and know. Are you prepared this morning? Are you ready for doomsday when it comes?